Welcome back to the latest. Joining us now on our panel, the spectators Rowan Dean, who's also a Sky News contributor, the former Queensland Premier, Campbell Newman, and the Labor strategist, Bruce Hawker. Good to see you all. Thank you for coming in. Campbell Newman, let's start with you. Mike Baird did today what a lot of politicians would like to do and choose the timing of his departure. Uh, look, I think he's uh, been uh, a, a great uh, uh, contributor to New South Wales. He's been a good Premier. Um, there's been a bumpy last 12 months, but uh, he goes out with his head held high. And uh, uh, frankly, um, it's hard to be a bit, not to be a bit envious. I mean, I actually offered to go myself at a certain point. That's not news, by the way. That's ancient history. But uh, look, I, I think uh, he leaves behind a great legacy. Uh, one other comment I'll just quickly make is I think, though, we now know that the officially the political shelf life for a politician uh, in lead a leadership position today in Australia is about three years. Um, there's a bit of a pattern building up here. Absolutely. I spoke with Morris Yemma, the former New South Wales Premier, before, and he pointed out to me that uh, since he resigned, there hasn't been another Premier in New South Wales over the past, uh, what, 10 years or so, uh, that has lasted longer than he did, which was a three-year term. Well, Barry O'Farrell well, was about it. the same, but you're yeah. right. There is this ba revolving Barry door O'Farrell, leaders. Campbell... Campbell Newman, Dennis Napthine, Ted yeah. Bailey, uh, Julia Gillard, Tony Abbott. It's sort of... Um, yeah. There's a bit this of a pattern developing here. Mm. There is. Rowan Dean, do you uh, believe it? We are very sceptical when leaders uh, or any politician comes out and says, I'm resigning for family reasons. Do you believe there was political pressure at play here as well? He did have a very rough 2016. I mean, first and foremost, I mean, it, it's tragic what uh, the, the health in the family, um, and that is absolutely 100% correct, and, and everybody must have their sympathies for Mike and his family. Um, but as you say, it has been a really, really tough year. Um, but I would disagree about the pattern. Um, it was largely... The, the reason uh, Mike Baird has had a, had a bad uh, year has been self-inflicted. It's not been from, from outside. Uh, a year ago, literally a year ago, he was the most popular Premier in Australia and he looked like he was set in for a long run at the top. And there's no reason for him not to have had a long run at the top. The, what he's done with the New South Wales economy has been fantastic. It was left a basket case by uh, four successive Labor Premiers who just trashed our economy in New South Wales. Mike Baird as first Treasurer and then as Premier turned it round. And the people of New South Wales are going to be the ones who lose out with Mike Baird going. Hopefully Gladys or whoever replaces uh, Mike Baird will carry on his, his good work. But the Greyhounds thing and the pub lockouts and the council amalgamations, none of which were necessary, all self-inflicted uh, and clearly unpopular. And that is what was so sad about this. Why embark on these social engineering experiments worthy of the Labor Party when you're busy running such an, uh, an effective economy? It, it was really sad. But I was just hoping there, Campbell, that you were going to say you were going to come down and help us out, because we could do with you, Campbell. No. Well, well, can I just take Rowan? Can I just take issue with one thing, and that is there you go. That's the, thing, a good point question. I, the point. The, the point I'm trying to make, though, is volatility. The, the pendulum yeah. swings so hard. How do you go from from sort of the the, the the sort of the penthouse suite to the doghouse in political terms in in only 12 months? And I know those were contentious things, but he did all those great things as well. And it just shows you how hard it is now. Uh, look, you know, I mean, if we're just going to go through the tea leaves, yes. Those were, you know, some issues there that uh, he, he should have sort of hit the eject button a long time before. Mm, um, yeah. And I really wondered about, about the dogs. But um, still, you, you, you'd wish that people were a bit more forgiving, frankly, <laughs> that given, given the way the state's going economically. Bruce Hawker, Morris yeah. Yemmer, labelled Mike Baird as one of uh, the best premiers that New South Wales has had. I spoke with John Watkins, the former deputy New South Wales premier, last hour, and he was full of praise as well. It seems like Labor, like Mike Baird, perhaps uh, more than some of the elements of the Liberal Party. Well, that might bring you back to some of Rowan's points earlier about uh, some of his social policies. But, uh, look, he benefited from a bold decision to sell off the electricity assets and then reinvest those in other projects, which certainly gave him uh, the, uh, the impression, at the very least, of being somebody who's going out and building and doing things for New South Wales. Now, Gladys Berejiklian will probably pay something of a price for that because the cost of some of those projects, like the light rail, are really blowing out and she's accepting some responsibility, or all responsibility for that. So 
they're the sorts of issues which are going to come back and bite in the medium term, which may actually prove to be very benef beneficial in the long term. But in the medium term, these sorts of big projects can be very difficult. I mean, look at the Opera House when it came, when it was built, that was highly controversial, and yet now it's one of our great icons of Australian, polit of Australian uh, institutions and architecture. I'm not uh, sure the tram's going to be up there with the uh, opera house, uh, Well, I, Bruce. You, you never, never know. know. You never like know. It. Well, who, <laughs> who knows? I, don't, I, doubt, I doubt it myself, <laughs> but there you go. Look, one other point I'd just make on this question about the longevity of premiers these days, uh, a lot of it comes down to the steadiness of the uh, management of the, of the economy and, and what's going on. I mean, Bob Carr was premier for 10 years, opposition leader for seven years before that. That's 17 years at the helm. He increased his percentage of the vote at every election he contested from 1991 to his last one in 2005. That shows what a master politician can do when they're running a pretty steady economy. Uh, Mike Rand in South Australia, Gallup in, uh, in Western Australia, uh, and Steve John Brax, Howard. all these. John, John Howard. John Howard up to 2007. Exactly. You and had, and, 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 but and since 2007, it's all gone to custard for... For both sides of politics, I'd have to say. It, it, that's largely true. And, and in recent times, that's, I think, had something to do with the way in which the economy's gone as well. It's been much more volatile. Look, you mentioned WA. Of course, we saw today Pauline Hanson launching her candidates in the West. She's announced some uh, 60 candidates overall uh, in the Upper House and the Lower House. Pauline Hanson polling at about nearly 11%, I think it was, in the Reachtel poll that was published last weekend. Of course, One Nation in Queensland, of course, uh, going to be another big force at, at that election, whether that's called later this year or, or early next year. Rowan Dean, what's your view on on how Pauline Hanson will go in these state elections and, and do you believe that, you know, voters there will embrace a leader who won't really get into the nuts and bolts of local issues? Pauline Hanson today refused to get into any policy issues while she was in Perth. Yeah, I think Pauline Hanson's going to have a great year. I think there's no doubt about that. And, uh, you know, if anyone's riding the, the Trump coattails, it's, it's got to be Pauline Hanson at the moment. Um, and, sh and that's a big wave to ride. And it all rests on uh, being anti-political correctness. Uh, she keeps touching these, these key points about uh, being, afraid, being not afraid to, to speak to the electorate about issues like immigration, as Trump did. Um, and that's really what she's got to focus on, the danger for Pauline Hanson. She will have a great year, both in Queensland and, I'm sure, in WA. The danger, as we've already seen, is the selection of the other candidates. And the, the, bigger, the, the bigger one nation becomes, the more uh, likely there are to be some unusual characters that uh, pop up for whatever reason. And the, it, it, the danger for one nation is growing ahead of its, its, its discipline and its structure, if you like. She's got to be very careful not to go off on these wild goose chases of this policy or that policy, but focus on those core issues to do with political correctness that work for Trump. Mm. You, you did Bruce right, Ograve interviewed yeah. the uh, opposition leader, oh, sorry, Mark McGowan earlier, and he, I asked him a few times, and of course he refused to say if Labor is willing to talk with One Nation about preferences. It poses quite the, the sort of strategic quandary, doesn't it, for the major parties as to how mm. to deal with One Nation on the preferences front? Well, it does, well, and... I was just going to say, in Western Australia, she'll probably pick up uh, four or five seats in the upper house. Uh, it's broken up into six super electorates, and uh, there are six members in each one of those. So uh, a primary vote uh, of below 14% will get her a seat in each one of those uh, upper house electorates. And, and so she would be looking to get preferences, at the very least, from... Uh, the Liberals, I think it'll be much harder for Labor to, prevent, to present her with preference deals. Um, just as Labor really was quite successful in Queensland in 1998 by refusing to deal with, uh, with, with Pauline Hanson and One Nation when they got 22% of the vote, uh, BD won because he picked up seats in the city. I'm not sure that that's going to happen this time around. She's a, uh, a different force and people seem to be more comfortable with her, not just in regional uh, Australia but in the cities as well. Well, she's changed style a bit. And uh, Campbell Newman, how and, does... Uh, yeah, yeah she, she's changed her style. I was going to say, um, how does the LNP deal with this in Queensland? Well, well the, the problem exists for both the Labor Party and the LNP and, and really, in a nutshell, what's happening is... She's going to bleed seats from the Labor Party. 
Uh, she will bleed seats away from the LNP and she got a defection there <coughs> with uh, former Minister Steve Dixon mm. uh, last week. And particularly she will do well in regional Queensland and middle ring, outer ring sort of suburbs in, in Brisbane or south-east Queensland. So now right now, I mean, she's doing very well up north. I mean, uh, there was an interesting piece in The Australian by Graham Richards response that she got. He was in a, sitting in a restaurant, apparently, and she was treated like, um, you know, sort of uh, like the Messiah, I suppose, to characterise it. Um, very strong. There was a, a, a sort of a, a reader survey in the Townsville Bulletin uh, that was announced yesterday and a sample of about 574 respondents. She came in ahead of the other parties. She was in first place. 27% of people who responded said they're going to back One Nation. So ultimately, she's going to get seats and she will decide who she partners with and allows to become government, I suppose I'd put it like that. That's, that's clear as, as anything at the moment. Yeah, There's something dramatic changes. I think that's absolutely right. And, but as Rowan said earlier, I think the, the key point about One Nation, as we saw post-1998 in Queensland, is that there can be a great surge of support for them. Uh, and then when you see the people who are representing uh, One Nation and what they're doing in the parliament, the uh, vote can fall away very quickly. They won 11 seats in 1998, and within a year, they are a completely spent force. And, uh, and that's the danger for them. It's, uh, it's the candidates they elect, the lack of discipline that they demonstrate from time to time, the infighting, and what happens when they actually have to exercise power. That's going to be what's oh. going to be the big challenge for them. There's no doubt in my mind that they'll have a good nine, uh, 2017. The question is what it'll be like by 2018. I thought well, Bruce, I, I think the opportunity yeah, Dean, for think... both the Labor Party and the, the LNP is they've got to prosecute that argument right now. They've got to they've got to put that to the electorate, and we're not really seeing it at the moment. We need, you know, if 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 they want to sort of curtail this sort of relentless march, uh, then both the, the government and the opposition need to be um, out there on the front foot on the issue. Yeah, I was, I was going to say, Campbell... Yeah, Rowan Dean, we've mentioned that she's a different candidate now, Pauline Hanser, yeah. you know, a, a, a renewed, fiercer politician than, than last time around. But I guess, Rowan Dean, the question of, of her candidates, I mean, are they up to that as well? They could be the ones that, that let her down once they are actually elected and, and their performance, of course, is, um, you know, fresh faces, newbies who don't have a lot of experience could pull her up short. Yeah, well, I thought it was fascinating to read that, uh, or she said that uh, she spent two days over in WA selecting uh, her 60-odd her candidates. So that's, what, 10 or 15 minutes each. Uh, it's kind of like a casting for a, uh, you know, uh, um, extras in a movie or something. You're going to get some of them right and you're going to get some of them badly wrong. But uh, this, we, we, we talk all the time about, uh, you know, how terrible it is that we have these machine politicians and, and, and on Bruce's side you have the Labor Party, they come up through the union ranks, on the Liberal Party uh, they, they come up through their own uh, organisations and, and, and there's lots of problems with that, but at least the majority of the candidates by the time they do uh, uh, get voted mm. in, uh, we, we know what they stand for and they, and they know their lines pretty well, <laughs> which may not be the case after the 15-minute uh, auditions with Pauline in WA. There, there was an interesting policy announcement she made this week in Queensland, which uh, has me scratching my head for someone who, who really is going to rely heavily on support from the regions. She um, has proposed uh, cutting the number of people in the mm. lower house, re-establishing the upper house. Now, that would be disastrous for, um, you know, rural and regional Queensland representation. I mean, we've got an electorate now, Mount Isa, Robbie Catter, he's... God, he's... he's he, it's sort of... It's the size of, of, of a couple of small European countries. So, you know, I don't know why she announced that. I don't see that it works for her. And I, again, if I was uh, in the LNP or the ALP prosecuting the case for why you shouldn't support them, I'd be pushing hard, well... You know, she, does she really care about the region? So that, that's a really interesting development, I reckon. And that's why she really just has to stick to climate change, 
immigration, terrorism. Stick to those three. She goes off, they, you know, you can have a thought bubble tomorrow about daylight savings or this or that or a Senate for, for Queensland. And uh, as you say, Campbell, uh, you're going to make as many enemies as friends if you start doing that. And she should really just concentrate on those three issues. Uh, there was a period when they were talking about, uh, she, you know, she was into a whole uh, anti-vax type thing. Again, nonsense best avoided. Uh, her party must stick to those three core things or they'll have endless problems. But that'll be the, that will be the challenge because yeah, noted. they're fattest and, uh, you know, they, 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 uh, they'll adopt the most recent uh, issue to, uh, to run with or their pet issue. It might be fluoride or a, it'll be some other issue that will, uh, will dominate the, the, the talk for some time. That's the sort of thing I think the major parties have to focus on too. Does she really, you know, have well, yeah, the big was... picture in, in mind? And I think that was the danger in the comments. That's right. And actually... it was GST today in Perth as well. So it, it, you know, it's hard to come into a, a new state and suddenly jump on the bandwagon. And sure, in WA, the GST argument works well, but that might not go down so well with One Nation supporters in other states. Gents, we are actually out of time. We need to move on. Thank you so much for coming in. We do appreciate it, Bruce Hawker, Campbell Newman, Rowan Dean. Good to talk with you as always. Thank you.